Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, our second webinar on college funding and scholarships. You are truly in, or this evening, you're truly in for a very special presentation where you'll receive a lot of information from Christy Murray, who is very well versed uh, professionally and also as a parent in both of these areas. Last week we met and we uh, had a webinar on the HBCUs and the college admission process. And we're continuing um, our sessions today with college funding and scholarship webinar. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Murray um, for a few words and she can begin. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight as we talk about some very important topics such as college funding and scholarships. So we're happy to have this opportunity to talk to students and their families. We are recording this webinar so that we can post it for those students who are unable to participate tonight. So some of the key objectives for our webinar tonight are to make sure that we take some time to equip students with practical college funding strategies, um, share useful strategies to search and apply for scholarships, and also discuss any other relevant uh, information that may pertain to COVID-19. I certainly wanna make this an interactive discussion. So if you would like to ask questions, I will try to monitor the chat as I'm speaking um, and possibly use Kristen to help me with that in case I miss a question um, that may be relevant and we have time to um, cover that question as we move forward. But feel free to post a question or at the end of the session, there'll also be an opportunity for Q&A. So this event is sponsored by Stafford County High School, the Office of Equity and Accountability. So we're happy to have Stafford County students participating today. Um, also, um, in conjunction with Stafford County Public Schools, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Psi Psi Omega chapter is also serving in your community. We cover Stafford and Fauquier counties, and we certainly also want to, um, we're happy to partner with Stafford County Public Schools on this event. We were chartered June 7th, 2014, and we're located right here in the, in the area. And so we certainly work, we work to um, put together a lot of different community service related activities for students and families. Tonight, our webinar will cover two of our key signature program initiatives. The first one is our hashtag CAP program, where we work to assist students, um, high school juniors and seniors particularly, get through the college admissions process. We also are using this as an opportunity to talk about building economic legacy, and it starts with yourself in terms of funding and being more informed about financial planning, how to accumulate wealth, and other key financial topics. So the fact that we're talking about college funding and scholarships certainly hits that particular target too. We wanna make sure that we um, have an opportunity to give student giveaways. So SciSci Omega will be sponsoring our student giveaways for tonight's webinar. So stick around to the end. Um, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Dr. Christy Murray. I live in Stafford County. I am a two-time author of both the books you see there, the one on the left in green, College Planning Strategies, I Wish Someone Had Told Me, and College Funding Strategies, I Wish Someone Had Told Me. I'm also the vice president of the Sasai Omega chapter that I mentioned earlier. So programs, I'm also the program chair, and I'm really um, excited about the work that we do in our Stafford and Fauquier County communities. So as I start this talk, I wanna share a little bit about my personal journey with college planning and funding. Um, back Way back in the day in 1993, I was a high school senior, um, not too different from many of you. We didn't have the internet back then, but back then um, it was still very important to start thinking about your plans for college, having a system in place that will help you to be effective. And for me, I really didn't have a lot of help with that and there wasn't the internet for me to go and pull a lot of information offline to do that. So you really had to read books, talk to people who have had those experiences. And so the benefit to you all is that you now have someone, um, well now you have a whole network of people, the internet and resources to pull from. 
the only other thing that I'll share with you is at the time in which I was a senior, I had two sisters who were currently in college. They're twins. They're about a year and a half older than me. And I visited all these colleges and I knew I wanted to go to Hampton University. And my mother said to me one day, hey, Hampton's a private school. So if you want to go to Hampton, we've got to figure out how to pay for it because I can't afford it out of pocket. So I began rolling up my sleeves, putting together some useful tools and resources that'll help me along the way. And I started talking to individuals who I thought could help me, like my school counselor. And so she actually um, reached out to me one day and said, hey, what if I told you there's a scholarship for a company who wants to help a student get to college? And I said, that'd be great. She said, they're looking for a student who wanted to go to Hampton University and major in engineering. That's exactly what I wanted to do. So she said, there's only one caveat. Can you get your application out by tomorrow? It wasn't emailed, it wasn't sent electronically, it had to be postmarked in the mail. And I told her if she could get my transcripts out, I would make sure I went home and pulled together all those documents I talked about earlier to get those out. I did. Two interviews later, they called me back and they offered me the scholarship. It helped me to fund five years of engineering school at Hampton University. And one of the key takeaways that I wanna share with you, one, that I'm a lifelong learner, so I love to learn, but I think you can do that in, a, in an affordable way. So I made it my mission to help students just like you because I had help and I was very grateful for that help to also help other students to be able to do the same. And that is why I wrote the book, the second book that I, I, I talk about um, frequently, the black book, uh, College uh, Funding Strategies, I Wish Someone Had Told Me. And I wrote this book because after I wrote the first book about how to get accepted into college, you would be surprised how many families I had say to me, well, Christy, we got into college, but guess what? Now we've got to figure out how to pay for it. And I said, ha, I need to be providing some great resources and practical strategies to help families do that. As you see depicted on the screen, those are my 10, my top 10 strategies to help you through this journey. So I'm going to cover a few of these strategies as we talk tonight. Now, one thing I'll tell you about those strategies is they really work. I have two sons who are currently in college, so I'm also sharing these things with you from a parental standpoint. As a student who went to school on scholarships, as a professional who's helped thousands of families across the country, and as a mother of current college students. My son on the left goes to Old Dominion University. My son on the right goes to Norfolk State University and they're both doing really well in school. And the one on the right who's playing football, he's in college right now on both athletic and academic scholarships. So all these strategies that I'm sharing with you are things that I have firsthand knowledge of that I hope will make a difference in your journey um, through the college funding process as well. So as I transition to talk about a journey tonight, I'd love to invite you to join me on a brief journey as we talk about college funding. Um, one of the things I will share with you is college funding is just as important as getting into college. Getting those applications in is just merely the first step. Another equally important step is how are you going to pay for it? So let me help you through that journey. So we're going to go take a little road trip, and here's a road map. I'm going to cover five key areas. One, we're going to talk about your current funding situation. Then we're going to talk about knowing the cost of attending college, and then customizing your funding approach. How can you do that to make sure you have a solid plan? And then fourth, we're gonna talk about how do you apply for financial aid? And lastly, how, do, how can you look and apply for scholarships? So if you have a situation where you need more money, how can you find it looking for scholarships? So first, I want to introduce you on this road trip or this journey to the first step, which is assess your current funding situation. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is in my book, here it is, I also put together a workbook. Here it is. You can't hardly see it with the background I have. There it is. But it's a student workbook to help you to be able to write out what those things are along your journey. And one of the tools in there is a template. You'll, you'll hear me refer to a whole lot of different templates that are in my book and my workbook. And it's designed this way to help you to be more deliberate about your planning. 
And if you notice in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the screen on several slides, you'll see the book name, the strategy number, and the page numbers. You can find that strategy in my book as a reference. But here's why this first step on assessing your current funding situation is important. Have you ever tried to take a trip and you use your GPS or your navigation system and it has no point of reference of where you were starting from? If you just say, hey, I want to go to Dillard's in Fredericksburg, and you don't, and it doesn't have the ability to say, hey, well, are you at home right now? Like, how can I, I need a baseline to determine where you're going to go next. This operates the same way. The first thing I advise families to do, both students and parents, is to think about what it is you're currently doing in terms of funding. If you're a student or a parent, do you know your GPA? What do you do in terms of a plan? What do you plan to major in if you're a student? What type of colleges are you thinking about as a student or parents are you, as you're helping your students? Public school, private schools. Do you plan to live on campus or off campus? Campus. There's different financial realities to all of these questions. How much does it cost to attend college for one year, four years, or whatever your reality is? You should be thinking about these things. What is your parents' household income? How many students know their parents' household income? I hope the parents know, but if you don't know as a student, um, these are kind of some of the things that I want you to be thinking about. How much have you or your parents saved towards college? How, are you having those conversations with your parents about, hey, I'm getting close to college. What is our plan and approach to pay for it? And then how much have you budgeted your senior year for expenses? Cap and gown, prom, homecoming, college applications, um, housing fees, you name it, all those different realities that will hit you your senior year. It's okay right now if you don't have the answer to these questions. By the end of my webinar today, I hope that you will start to formulate a plan and to be able to answer these questions with a lot more confidence than you may be able to do right now. Um, if you could drop me in the chat, students and parents, let me know if you are a junior, senior, freshman, sophomore, what year are you in college or excuse me, high school right now um, so that I can kind of gauge how I want to tailor the conversation today. So if we have the predominant number that are of uh, participants in, you know, 10th or 11th grade, then my conversation can be tailored more towards those who are in attendance. But one, as you're dropping that in the chat, thank you, Cassandra and others, um, I would encourage you to do so, so I can make sure I help you. But I will tell you that most students in high school are in what I consider the late stage. Don't be alarmed by the terminology late, but it's in a later stage towards planning for college. And it's generally eighth through 12th graders. And that simply means somewhere between a year from now or less to five years, you're gonna be gearing up to actually go to college. So it looks like we have some 11th graders, 12th graders, 10th graders. Great. Um, it looks like we have a good variety. So what that means by being in the late stage is that you need to be thinking about your income, saving some money, looking for scholarships and grants, making sure you understand financial aid. So the first step is know your current situation. Now, as you're moving along this journey and you know your current situation, I also think it's important for you to know the cost of attendance. Very important. In fact, you should be considering the cost of attendance when you're choosing a college, when you're choosing a major. You should always pick your major first, as we talked about in last week's webinar, and you should absolutely pick your college with the cost in mind. The cost of attendance, and you'll hear a lot of um, schools refer to this, and you'll even see it on your financial aid award letter, it's just simply how much it costs to go to college. It includes both direct costs, how much those, those costs that are directly paid to the college or university, um, such as room and board and tuition fees, and it also includes indirect costs. These are costs that the school doesn't necessarily get, but they sure will come out of your pocket, like books. Uh, financial expenses like laundry, your cell phone, medical expenses, transportation, um, those kind of things are usually more indirect, but they're still relevant and important as you matriculate in college. So as you look at the cost of college, um, do know that the tuition rates tend to increase with inflation 
as we've seen over the years. Um, you know, there is a difference, um, even with COVID being our reality and what some of those costs may be. Um, about a year ago or a year and a half ago, when many students were sent home for virtual learning, they reduced some of their costs because they didn't have the room and board uh, part of the, the fees to have to account for because they were online. Now that a lot of students are going back to the universities, they have to um, factor those costs in. And I also want to um, certainly remind each of you that some colleges are more expensive than others. Go where you can afford. As you can see from the US News um, clip that I provided, 2019-2020, um, the average tuition and fees looks very different. If you're going to a in-state public school, a public school, let's say in the state of Virginia, for example, it roughly costs 10K. If you decided to go to a public school in a different state, it would have doubled and cost you uh, 22K. And if you decided to go to a private school, that same tuition was likely to be triple what it is a public school. Why? Because you are going to a private school that doesn't have an in-state and out-of-state tuition rate. They only just have one student tuition. And they don't get a lot of their funding from the federal and state government governments like the public schools do. And that's a key differentiator. So as you can see, private schools can tend to cost more than public schools. This is the reason why I encourage students and, and parents to pick colleges they can afford based on what you want to major in. Then you make sure that college, those colleges on your short list, they have your majors and you're looking at how much each one of them will cost. The other thing I want to remind students of in particular is time is money. If you graduate in four years, fantastic. That should be your goal. I used to tell my sons when they were little, go to college and graduate. And graduate on time if you can. Why? Because the longer you're in school, if it takes you six years to get a four-year degree, you're going to pay more for your education than you would if you had taken four years serious. So if you can get in and get out with an undergraduate degree, or if you're going to work on an associate's degree in two years, or a vocational or apprenticeship in a year or two, make sure you think about taking it seriously so that you don't end up paying more for the same education. So now that you know what the cost of attendance is, I certainly want to make sure that you have a customized funding plan. And if you're sitting here and you're wondering, huh, what does she mean by that? The one question I have to you is, what is your plan to pay for college? And I hope you're thinking about it. One of the things that I um, provided um, as a tool for families in my book is this template. It's called a college funding plan template. Why? Because I want to encourage each of you to develop and execute your college plan. When I talk about admissions, I have a similar plan. Develop and execute your college admissions plan. It is not uncommon for them to be the same plan. But since we're focused on funding, I'll focus on that. Your plan should not be complicated. Nobody's going to follow a complicated plan. It should be simple and effective. It should have your goals listed out along the left, what type of goal it is, how much it's going to cost you, the start date, the due date, how far are you along with completing it, and any other relevant facts or notes about what you need to include in your plan. Why is this important? Because if you don't have a plan, you're going to struggle and all these things are going to come at you at the wrong time and that's your senior year and you're going to feel a bit overwhelmed and you don't have to feel overwhelmed. Now, pay close attention to the cost column because I mentioned earlier um, the fees, as you hit your senior year, things can get pretty expensive. Anybody in the chat wants to wage a guess as to how much I spent just a little over two years ago with helping my senior at the time with his college application fees? My youngest son, who's now playing Division I football, applied to 13 colleges. So I'll give you a context clue. 13 colleges. Um, Stacy Hinton, no, it wasn't quite 84,000, but it felt like it at the time. Um, Adriana, um, you're not too far off. In fact, you've probably been the closest of anyone who I've posed that question to over the last two years since I've been doing webinars, $980. Adriana said 990, so you're very, very close. 
cost me almost a thousand dollars to cover all those college application fees. And that's just one activity on the plan. So I want to invite you to make sure you're thinking about what these individual activities on your college fund will cost. As you're thinking about what they cost, I also want to encourage you to think about what are the different ways you can pay for college? It's not really just one way. Um, I encourage people to have a toolbox of different approaches to take with it. One way is to look at your household income or your household sources. Um, so whether you're a parent, a guardian, or the student or scholar themselves, you want to be thinking about your out-of-pocket expenses. How much do you have in your bank account, your um, savings account to pay for college? You may have a college savings plan like the 529 plan that we have here in the state of Virginia. If you do, fantastic. Let me know in the chat if anybody has a 529. You can use your permanent life insurance. Uh, this is a great um, strategy if you can actually take money out of your life insurance plan to cover college and um, still have access to your life insurance. And then also you may um, use your retirement plan, your 401k, your thrift savings plan, and any other pension retirement plans you may have. I don't personally recommend dipping in your retirement plan for your child's future because it's for your retirement future. Um, so I would say this would probably rank to one of the more towards the last resorts. Um, I would exhaust all other means before I dip into my retirement. Um, so that's my recommendation to, to parents. And it's okay if you have your children put in a little sweat equity and students roll up your sleeves and just know that this whole process is your responsibility. So we certainly, I want to encourage you to take ownership of this entire process and roll up your sleeves to help find the funding that you might need. Now, that was, those were the household sources. There's also a bunch of external or outside sources. It could be the colleges themselves giving you more money, your employers, um, my nephew got a McDonald's scholarship. He worked at McDonald's for 90 days, and um, he actually got money every school year for McDonald's. And I think his mom is actually on the webinar. And if you're okay with sharing, mom, can you share in the chat um, how much McDonald's gave out for him to um, in scholarships while he was working there? Um, there's a plenty of nonprofit and for-profit organizations. $2,500, $2,500 scholarship for working in McDonald's. Target has a great program. So these are just ways to, as you're young people, as you're, you're in high school and you're looking for a job, look for those jobs. Ask the question, how do you help students get through college? What resources do you provide students? And you'd be surprised what you'll learn. And individuals who aren't related to you, they may even want to donate for scholarships. Last year I had a, a summit, a youth summit, College Excellence Summit in August, and for the first time it was virtual. I was able to get individual donors to give students scholarships, and I'm doing it again August 13th and 14th this year, and I'll, you know, share more about that in the future. But the four key ways is through financial aid, you can get scholarships, which we'll talk more about, Grants, usually colleges, universities, the federal government, state government will have grant programs like the, right now one of the grants that a lot of students are getting um, are the, um, the CARES Act grants where they're giving college students a credit or a grant due to COVID. But you have to currently be a college student to get access to some of those. And there's tons of other grants. And then again, employer education reimbursement. So there's a lot of different ways that, you know, a lot of, I don't want any student who may be from a low income household to hear, well, we don't make a lot of money. You can't afford to go to school. Please don't let that be your reality. Whether you want to go to a vocational two-year school, a community college, or a four-year school, there is money for every circumstance. Please don't let anybody tell you that it's not, because it is. Now, as you think about paying for college, I want to break down financial aid in a bit more detail. Financial aid is simply money that's given to you to help you to pay for college, mostly coming from colleges and universities. Um, the federal government gives away over $120 billion a year to over 13 million students. Every year, 13 million people get financial aid from the federal government. 
whether it's in the form of work study, where you work on campus and they help offset some of the cost of your tuition, whether grants, which we've talked about, which is free money you don't have to pay back, and my favorite scholarships, free money you don't have to pay back. And then there's always student loans. They'll be offered to you, and I don't encourage you to take those unless you absolutely need the student loans because you're gonna have to pay that back and sometimes with interest. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Education, there's 1.6 trillion people in the United States. No, excuse me, 1.6 trillion dollars that are currently owed in student loans. And there's 45 million people or borrowers who owe that 1.6 trillion dollars. The average person back in 2020, 2020 owed $32,000 in student loans. My son and I had this big debate. Well, mom, if student loans are so high, I think college is a scam. Why go to college at all? And I'll tell you this. One, you can go to college without student loan debt. Two, you try making it out here with high inflation and low income rates right now without a college education. It gives you just one more opportunity to differentiate yourself from competition. It's not the begin all end all to having a successful life in terms of earning potential, but it is a great opportunity for you to have education behind you. So I just want to throw that out there. And if at all possible, if you you know want to graduate without the burden and the debt of student loans weighing you down, um, try to minimize how many student loans you need and how much student loan money you use if you have to use it at all. I always think this is interesting. I include this here. Um, Virginia's not on the top 10 list, so we can all take a sigh of relief here. But it's interesting to see the top 10 schools, or states, excuse me, the top 10 states where students owe student loans. California, $135 billion, almost 4 million people in California. And it goes all the way down. You see New York on the list, Ohio, Pennsylvania, a state right below us, uh, North Carolina, with $44 billion and $1.2 million. So it just kind of puts it into perspective. Um, it doesn't have to be your reality, but there's a real crisis with student loans right now. And one of the things, reasons why I do the work that I do helping students is we really need to triage this crisis in this situation and really give students affordable options on not having to have so much debt. So as we talk about not having as much debt and financial aid itself, that brings us to the fourth place along our roadmap journey. How do you apply for that financial aid? If you haven't heard of the free application for federal student aid, and you'll hear me refer to it throughout this webinar as the FAFSA, let me introduce you to it. Let me know in the chat if you've ever heard of the FAFSA. The FAFSA is required if you want to get that. Remember, I just showed you the, uh, where we, what was it? I just showed you this where, you know, the federal government gives out $120 billion to over 13 million students. If you have any chance or desire of getting federal financial aid, you must fill out the FAFSA. Great. I'm glad to hear some of the parents and students have heard about it. It is used by colleges to determine how they're going to calculate your financial aid eligibility as a student. Every college's calculation is different. On October 1st of each year, for that upcoming academic year, they open up their new application. So they'll make tweaks to it, clean it up, make sure it meets the federal guidelines, and they'll publish the new application in October. It's free. Even if you get a full scholarship or millions of dollars in scholarship funding, I have students say, do I really need to fill out the FAFSA? Absolutely. There is no, no situation that I don't recommend you filling out your FAFSA form. Even if your parents have a 529 or they have all your costs covered, fill it out anyway. Why? What happens if your circumstance change and you haven't? Always do the most so that you can give yourself the least amount of stress later on. Seniors. How many seniors do we have on the webinar who have not completed their FAFSA, but you have started applying to colleges. I'm hoping that all my seniors have completed their FAFSA. Um, most colleges won't give you a penny until they see your FAFSA hit their radar. So when you're completing the FAFSA, you'll need to designate 
that college. There's a place, kind of like when you take the SAT or ACT test, it'll ask you, which colleges do you want us to send your FAFSA to? Make sure all the colleges that you've applied to are receiving. You go into the system and you update your FAFSA. You may have to, if you, if you, I think there's a certain number, I want to say like eight to 10 colleges you can put in initially. And if you have to go back and add more colleges, like I had to do with my son, because he had 13 schools, then it'll let you, I waited a couple days, I went back in and I made some corrections and I switched out a couple of the schools and added the new schools in so that every one of his schools will have that FAFSA completed and sent to them. Here's something very important. I don't know if any parents have students currently in college like I do, or if you have siblings currently in college, but if you do, please remind them that every year that they're in college, they have to complete the FAFSA every single year as a freshman in college, sophomore, junior, and senior if you plan on going on to graduate school. If you plan on graduating your senior year of college and saying, I'm taking a break, you don't have to do it the next year. But if you're planning to go to graduate school or medical school or law school, still complete the FAFSA and designate your colleges. I hope that helps. Um, the website is listed here, um, fafsa.ed.gov. I would encourage you to have your documents in front of you, sit down with your parents and have your tax forms. Your parents may need their W-2 statements, their bank statements, asset statements, whatever your financial uh, profile is, you wanna have those documents. Um, as you're completing the FAFSA online, as you can see from the screenshot, um, both the students and the parents will need a FSA ID um, it's kind of like, because when you're a student, you have to go in and fill out some things and sign. And then they also have um, parents or whoever's preparing it, they have to go in and sign some things. So you have to have an account and your student has to have an account. Um, parent, if you have multiple students in college like I do, I only needed one account um, for both of my students. But you're going to have to fill out the FAFSA for every child in your house every year while they're in college. And then you will receive a report once you've gone through and it will prompt you. It's kind of like doing your taxes. It'll prompt you through all these different steps if you ever use like TurboTax. And it'll keep asking you questions um, about your financial situation, your household situation. And then it will spit out a report with your expected family contribution listed on it. Now your expected family contribution, it seems so complicated when you think about it, but it's really very simple is how much money they think you can pay out of your own pocket. What? It's not how much money they're going to give you. The EFC is how much they think, based on your income, your family's income, how much they think you can pay. That's where they're going to use to base your needs on, on how much other financial aid. So if your EFC is low, it means they don't think you can pay very much out of pocket. So they get likely to give you more financial aid. But if your EFC is high, 20K, 30K, 40K, 50K, you're probably going to get less financial aid options, probably more student loan-ish type things, work study. Um, but it's all based on your individual situation. And every college will calculate it different. But they will use this information to determine your eligibility. And not, um, it doesn't tell you the total, how much you'll pay out of pocket, but it gives you a good sense of what they believe you should be able to contribute to some extent. So if you're wondering, well, what goes into this EFC calculation? Well, how do they know how much my EFC should be, whether it should be really low or high? They're looking at these seven factors. They're looking at your parent income, um, their taxable income as it shows up on their 1040 IRS, uh, IRS tax filing, or their untaxable income. Taxable and untaxable? Mm-hmm, they do. The number of people who live in the student's household. So in my case, me, uh, my two sons, it would be a total of three. If you have five people living in your house, it would be five. Um, they're looking at the number of students in college. In my case, I have two sons in college. So that helps to lower my EFC because they're like, this lady's going to have to juggle with both of these kids. So the more students in college, um, the more that factors into your calculation. And then they also look at the student's income. What? I'm just a student, Miss Christie. They don't care. Um, they're looking at your income. They don't consider your work-study income. So if you're already in college 
and you're getting work study, they're not going to double hit you for working while you're in college. But any other income you may have, taxable and untaxable, they will. They're looking at your assets. Do you own rental property? Do you own boats? Do you own X, Y, or Z? They're looking at those assets that they may um, factor into your calculation. The age of the oldest parent. And then any assets that the scholar may have. So they're looking at both the parent income and assets and the student income and assets. And believe it or not, there are some students that do have assets. If you are nervous and you're like, well, you know, I don't have any idea what this EFC is going to look like, please know that there are tools that allow you to estimate your EFC. Studentaid.gov has an understand dash aid. They have an estimation tool. Even the college board where most students go to register for the SAT, they also have one on bigfuture.collegeboard.org. If you Google either one of those, they'll come up, but also I'll share the slides from tonight's webinar with family so you'll be able to access those from my presentation as well so miss christy you've talked about what financial aid is why you have to complete the fafsa you have to share which colleges you send those you want those scores sent to what happens next i used to do a bunch of talking trying to help families understand it and then i realized i need a visual so they probably need one too so i created this little flow chart and it's really simple. In the blue box, this is the important thing we just talked about with you and your, your um, parent or you and your children sitting down to complete the FAFSA and selecting the colleges. You should sit down and do the FAFSA when you know what your major is because that'll dictate which colleges you're interested in applying to to make sure they have your program. And then you want to select those colleges and add them to your application. Once you do that and hit submit, they're going to work on the government side and they're going to calculate this new AFC number I just described to you. And they're going to also send your report to those colleges. And then as you apply to colleges, and this is very important because you'd be surprised how many seniors I'm helping now who applied to the colleges but didn't complete their FAFSA. I mean, they applied early in like September, October, and they're wondering why they haven't heard anything about back about how much money they're going to get. It's because they didn't do the FAFSA in conjunction with applying to colleges. If you're applying to colleges in September and October, you should be completing the FAFSA in September and October because they give out their funding on a first come first serve basis. The colleges will get that EFC. They're going to calculate what they're going to give you in your um, financial aid award package. And then in the purple box, they're going to send you an award letter. So when you get mail from the colleges you've applied to, open everything up, pay attention to all the deadlines, and pay attention to the action steps you must take next. You'd be surprised how many families are like, whoo, I got in. See y'all in the fall. Please don't do that. You should likely receive your, um, and I thank you for that question, Stacy. You should receive your um, award letters after you've gotten admitted into the college. And usually, I would say, and each college is different, but I had a case where a student had applied and completed her FAFSA, and she did it back in September, October, and in March, she still hadn't received her financial aid letter. If you, I, I say give it a month, no more than two months from the time in which you applied and got accepted. I say a month. Worry them silly, because I think the funding part is very important, and you don't want to be overlooked. Every month, I would encourage you to call the financial aid office and say, haven't gotten my award letter, haven't gotten my award letter, still haven't gotten it. She ended up calling, and they hadn't sent any of those out yet for her college. But you don't want to find out in June what your funding profile looks like because it, you can't pick a school until you see what they're all offering you. So once the college sends you that award letter, you have to determine, they'll tell you, we're going to give you this much in grants, this much in scholarships, if any, um, this much in student loans and this much in work study. They'll categorize it all out, line item it out on the actual award letter. And then they may have a section that says, this is how much we expect you to pay out of pocket because everything we just say we were giving you isn't enough to cover it. So if you don't have to pay anything out of pocket and you already have enough financial aid and you're satisfied with your award package for that college you want to go to, then great, your job is done. If you have a shortfall, you're like, wait a minute, they want me to take out $3,500 in loans. Uh, let's see what else we can do to find scholarships 
before we just accept those loans. So if that's the case, or if you have to pay out of pocket and you're like, oh, let's see what else we can do before I have to pay out of my own pocket, then I would encourage you to look for scholarships. And we're going to talk more about that in just a second. Um, this is the most unideal situation, um, in my opinion, where, you know, you're looking at how much you got from your financial aid award letter and you realize that 75% they wanted me to pay myself out of my pocket. I can't afford that. Even though they think I can, I can't. And they're only giving me 5% in scholarships and 20% and work study, financial aid, you know, um, loans, et cetera. Phew. That's really heavy burdensome for families to have to pay 75% out of pocket. Here's a more ideal situation in my mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. You get 75% in scholarships and grants, free money, you don't have to pay back. And then you might have 20% um, in financial aid, grants, other grants, um, work study. I always recommend doing work study before you do loans. Let the kids get in and get a little sweat equity if they can you know, juggle the academics and work a little bit on campus before they have to kick in the loans because you're going to have to pay that back later with interest. And then 5% out of pocket. You might be like, hey, I can swing 5%, but that 75% was a stretch. So as you have applied for financial aid and realize I have a shortfall, they want me to pay all this extra money out of my own pocket or out of my parents' pockets. What does that look like and what does that mean? It means it's time to look for scholarships, which is gift aid. Have a plan for how you're going to approach looking for scholarships. This, I'm very passionate about this area um, in the webinar um, as I talk to families because most families don't want to take the time and the effort to look for them. There are so many different types of scholarships out here that it is unbelievable. And billions of dollars of scholarship money go unclaimed every year because students don't want to apply. And as you can see in one of the bullets, bullets down here, don't run from the essays. They don't want to write the essays. Um, they don't want to take the time. Time is money. Either you're going to sacrifice your time on the front end or your money on the back end. You get to make that choice. So what I encourage families to do is to look for scholarships. There's so many different types. There's large dollar amount scholarships, small dollar amount scholarships. Look for both. Don't discriminate. Unless you're allergic to money, don't turn your nose up to a $500 scholarship because it can cover books. It can co cover other expenses. And certainly apply for the larger ones. Um, don't limit where you apply. You would be surprised how many students, even in their local communities, there's so many scholarships that are out there. Chamber of Commerce, nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations, businesses, Greek organizations, religious organizations, all kind of um, just employers um, here in this area, all have scholarships. And Dr. even Murray? my, so, oh, excuse me, just, even, yes. I was about to, you go ahead and then I'll piggyback on what you're about to say. Oh, I was gonna say, even our local, um, our local AKA chapter has scholarships. And what we find is many students don't apply, but here's the value in applying for local scholarships. And then I'll let Kristen share her point. The local scholarships have low application pools. If few people apply, what does that say about your odds and chances of getting awarded a scholarship if you meet the eligibility requirements? It's significant. So I'm gonna pause and allow Kristen to share. Just, just real quick, um, Dr. Murray mentioned that our sorority does offer scholarships. And in the chat a little while back, I did put the link uh, for our, our sorority um, scholarship. They're due April 15th. There's a number of them. But if you go into the chat and just, just look, um, I put the wrong one at first, Google Maps. Don't know why I did that. But then right underneath it is the link for um, Psi Psi Omega Alpha Kappa Alpha um, sorority. Thank you for that, Kristen. Mm -hmm. And what I'll share with many scholarship applications, even ours, our scholarship that Kristen just talked about is for students who live and go to school in Falkir, Stafford counties, and Quantico area, males and females. So males, we and I'll be honest, from my um, working with scholarships, the predominant of the applications are females. I don't know if males are allergic to money, 
but we certainly want to increase our pool of students overall and give everybody a fair shot to um, get awarded scholarships. Um, another key tip, I had the pleasure of meeting a young lady named Maya Mundale about three years ago and had coffee with her. And I asked her, um, what did you do and how did you get awarded over a million dollars in scholarships? And one of the key things she said that was a differentiator for me is that she found a scholarship mentor. Hmm, that's different. Well, I said, well, what do you mean by a scholarship mentor? She said she went out to some of the um, scholarship uh, websites like the Target Scholarship, Coca-Cola, Bill and Melinda Gates, you name it, all these different people who have these great fa um, foundations and scholarship um, followings. And they usually post the students' names and pictures of who was awarded their scholarships. So she reached out to a few and she found them on social media. So use those handheld devices on Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. Use these things to your benefit. And she reached out to a few of them and said, hey, I'm Maya. I'm interested in applying for scholarships. And I ran across, you know, this Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship. And I'd love to know what you did to differentiate yourself um, from the others and congratulations on being a winner of their scholarship. Do you mind giving me some pointers and some advice? And guess what? They didn't mind. The closed mouths don't get fed. If you don't ask, you'll never know the answer to it. But talk to other um, scholarship recipients, even right here in, in Stafford County, who you know may have gotten scholarships. If you go to a scholarship award ceremony and you've seen students at your school they have gotten scholarships. Talk to them. Don't just look at them and admire them from a distance. Walk up on them and say, hey, great job. What can I do? What did you do that can help me? And find out. And make sure that you um, read the instructions very carefully because every scholarship instruction is different. Every application is different. And so you want to read the instructions and make sure you provide all the requested documents. Nothing would get you disqualified as quickly from a scholarship review than not having all your documents. They're not going to look at your package any further than that. They're going to go down a checklist and say, did Christy have the application, this, 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 and this? And if not, you know what? We're going to put this to the side or just put it in a discard pile. And then I would encourage you to track your progress. Um, and I don't know if I put that tool in here, but if not, it's in my book. But I have a spreadsheet for students to be able to track how many each scholarship, and I did this with my own son, each scholarship, when it was due, how much the award would be, when we got the application in, which ones required an essay and which didn't, in one spreadsheet. It was very impactful. And then we sorted and organized each application by the due date. If they were due in January of 2022, for example, that should be first. If it's due in March, it should be later in the list. Why? Because you can, we would spend a month. So in December, my son and I, we sat down and said, let's look at all the January scholarships. Let's apply for those. And then in January, we looked at all the February scholarships. Now let's apply for those. And so you can have a method or a system to your approach. I also want to encourage you, for those who think, I don't have a high GPA, Miss Christie, I probably shouldn't apply for scholarships. Wrong answer. You should apply for scholarships because you are uniquely you. Um, there are needs, financial needs-based scholarships, so that if you fill out that FAFSA and you realize, whoo, our EFC is pretty low, or you fill out your FAFSA and you know you have a financial need, apply for financial need-based scholarships. Merit scholarships are those academic ones where they're looking at your GPA and likely your SAT and ACT scores. That's great. But there's also scholarships based on different interests. If you play the guitar, if you like to sing, if you mow lawns, if you basket weave, if you all these different things. If you have diabetes, if you're a vegetarian, you would be surprised. Yes, I've seen these scholarships for myself, my own two eyes. Anything that's unique about you that you don't think that there's a scholarship, I challenge you to come up with a topic, a random topic, and then Google vegetarian scholarships. I guarantee you they'll pop up. Military scholarships. I helped one of my cousins to graduate from college debt-free with a military ROTC scholarship. They paid his way through college. They gave him a monthly stipend while he was in college. They, he graduated from college and he was commissioned as a naval officer and he is living a fantastic 
debt-free life, didn't have to pay a penny for college, and he's since graduated and he's doing really well. So don't sleep on the military scholarships. And then athletic scholarships. There are certainly athletic scholarships. My son is going to school on one now. Um, I will tell you that if you're, if you're an athlete, let me know if you're an athlete in the chat. All right, if you are an athlete, um, then I would highly encourage you to align yourself with the NCAA Eligibility Center. I'm going to put that in the chat. NC, if it'll let me. Maybe Cassandra, could you add just what I said, NCAA Eligibility Center? I did this with my sons their sophomore year of high school. Most sports players, male and females, in high school, they don't realize that if you want to play collegiate sports and get collegiate, collegiate uh, I can't talk, um, collegiate scholarships, you must be eligible through the NCAA process. They have their whole, whole, their own academic guidelines. It's not the same as your high school graduation guidelines. Theirs are different. They have different GPA requirements. They have different SAT, ACT scores, all of the above. And so you want to make sure you are looking at their website long before your senior year. Nothing that I'm telling you in my webinar means you start any of this your senior year. If you have the ability to start earlier, you should do so. Um, Adriana asks, how long is the obligation for the military? It depends. Some obligations are two years, some are four. Some may not have an obligation at all. But you have to read that ROTC um, application. They'll spell all that out when the student is looking at Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps. They have different scholarship and ROTC programs. You have to look at it to determine what they're saying their obligation is. Um, for my cousin, his was four years with the Navy. And he's probably coming up on, I think he has like a year and a half left. It went really quick. And then he's deciding what he may want to do next from there. All right, here is one of the biggest questions I get from students and parents. Well, Ms. Christie, I don't know where to find scholarships. And my question is, where have you looked? Because if you just simply go to Google, you're going to find a whole bunch of things. You're going to find things based on you wanting to go for STEM. Um, you maybe picked a STEM major. Maybe if you play sports, um, you'll find a bunch of religious organizations, nonprofits. We've talked about some of these things. If you're good in the arts. Um, if you want to look for scholarships just by your major, oh, I want to major in physics, or I had some, I just posted some on a group that I'm in, and I'll share with you an exclusive group that I run, but it was for students interested in aerospace or becoming a pilot. So all these things are out there. Use Google to your advantage. I do. I did with my son, but here's my, here's my challenge, and I'm going to just say it like I'm thinking it. If you don't want to put in the effort, then just be willing to pull your money out of your pocket. If you're okay with doing some search, I had my son spend um, one day a week, spend 30 minutes a week looking for scholarships. Apply for five scholarships a week or five scholarships a day. Have a plan. That's why I say have a plan because it won't feel so overwhelming and burdensome if you have an approach that you want to take. Scholarships are everywhere. So don't tell me. They can't say to Christy, we can't find scholarships because my question is that means you haven't really looked. Here are some other places where you can look to find scholarships. How many of you are leveraging your high school counseling offices? I know the Stafford County, we have several different Stafford County representatives on tonight. And I will tell you that they have a wealth of scholarships, local scholarships, those gems I talked about. So become best friends with your school counseling offices. And find out, um, my sons went to school in Prince William County, one county over. They did a phenomenal job of pushing out scholarships weekly. And so we were going down their list and applying for those local scholarships too. Because they were looking for local students just like you. And they all had the same complaint. Not many students are applying. You be the ones to apply because you're going to increase your odds of getting those scholarships. Also, there are a, a, a plethora of online scholarship portals, uh, websites. Um, there, some are listed here that you can create an account, put in your personal information and your interest and what you want to go to school for. And they will provide you with a filtered list of scholarships that are designed for people who have the same interest as you. The eligibility fits your background. 
take advantage of those. And then there are a lot of organizations. Um, I'm in, I work in the oil and gas industry. The energy industry is giving out scholarships. The manufacturing industry is giving out scholarships. A lot of professional organizations, National Association of Engineers, National Association of Attorneys, whatever you want to major in, look for the Professional National Association for those majors. Most of them have a philanthropic branch foundation, a means of giving out scholarships. They're looking for students who want to be in their profession. So please take advantage of all the wealth of information on scholarships. Um, as Kristen mentioned, we do have one. Um, the website is also listed here. We give out scholarships. We give out a leadership scholarship, Think HBCU scholarship. We even help students who don't want to go to a four-year school. Every student doesn't want to go. But as I reminded you, there are scholarships even, not just with our sorority, but across the board for students who want to go to school for a vocation, a trade, an apprenticeship, or a community college as well. And if you are in school or you have family members in school, encourage them to keep applying for scholarships because there are continuing student scholarships all over the place. And then we have a scholarship for the arts. We certainly, one of our key program areas is um, helping students to um, be interested in the arts and promoting the arts. So we give out scholarships to help support what we find is important. Now, I want to make sure that I share with you my exclusive group. It's called Scholarships for Scholars. You can access it. Um, I only It's by invitation only or if I share this with you. So I would encourage each of you, I have it on Facebook and Instagram. Um, if you join, you have to re, uh, request access to join, but I share scholarships that I hear about um, with both in both of these areas. I share tools and tips. I share video clips of me as I learn about things. I share those and push them out to those in my exclusive group. So I hope that you will find value and join um, the group. It's just another means of getting access to um, scholarships that you ordinarily wouldn't hear about. Now you heard me mention earlier about tracking your progress. This is why I mentioned that, and this is what I use for my son. Um, it's also a template in my book and workbooks, but this is exactly what I mean where you can fill in the scholarship name and all the other information. Oh, this scholarship requires an essay. Oh, it also requires a letter, letter of recommendation. Oh no, test scores aren't needed for this one. Oh, they need the application in by a certain date. Oh, this is the date I actually submitted my application. And then the decision, track that too. This entity said, yes, they were gonna give me a scholarship of $2,500. This one said, no, no, yes, yes. It's so much value in seeing it laid out in one place. I, I can't tell you how helpful that was for me and my son. All right, so next up, I want to um, encourage you to, as you're applying for scholarships, there's different parts of the scholarship application just like there are parts of a college application. You have to have your application itself. You, they may ask you for financial documents, particularly if you're looking for, if you have a financial need. They may wanna know your SAT and ACT scores. Many want your transcripts, so make sure you understand, juniors and seniors in particular, how to get your high school transcripts. And if you went to multiple high schools, please make sure you know how to get those transcripts from all your high schools you attended. Um, they may ask you, if you're a continuing student or if you've gotten accepted into schools, some scholarship entities say, we only wanna give our money to students who've already been accepted. Then you may need to show your college acceptance letter or a verification letter saying, hey, I'm still in school. They may want you to write an essay or get letters of recommendation. They may have um, their scholarships earmarked for certain interests, like the one I talked about with the arts for example. So if you have those kind of backgrounds, pull all those things you're really good at out and use those to your advantage. And then the scholar profile, um, that's something that I help students to, um, I encourage students to have, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. I encourage each of you, and if you attended, um, let me know in the chat if you attended my talk last week um, when we talked about college admissions and HBCUs. Let me know in the chat if I have any repeat um, visitors. Um, but if you did, I shared this too. Every student needs a, a scholar profile. It's kind of like a one-page resume. And it is it tells the story of who you are. 
And it is simply a one page description of your background, what you want to do next. So you can provide a picture. You would put your address and your name address and email information. You would put your college desire. So if your objective is to go to a vocational school or a four-year college and major in, I'll just use me, I major in electrical engineering, you can put that down. And the educational summary, let's see if it's, yeah. This is an example of how it looks. You can have your educational summary what you did in high school, what school you went to, your current grade point average, your ranking poten potentially, your ACT scores or SAT scores, if you took those. What are your plans for college? Maybe I got accepted into Hampton and that's my first choice. Bam, add that there. When you expect to enroll, what's your intended major? So you can include these things. If you have any honors and awards since you've been in high school, eighth grade through the 12th grade, especially if you took high school courses in the eighth grade, like my sons did, I, we're adding everything. And so the value of doing this is that you do it every year while you're in high school. And when you hit your senior year, you don't have to remember everything you did four years ago. You've been updating it along the way. Your employment experiences, we talked about McDonald's, Walmart, whatever else you're doing, any, um, student organizations or extracurricular activities, if you were in student government, if you were in the band, National Honor Society, you played sports, add those things here. Community service, what do you do to volunteer and make a difference in your community? Add those, any relevant courses, like, you know, if you're majoring in engineering, for example, algebra, um, you know, if you did a networking class or those kind of classes might stick out. If you wanna be an attorney and you took a business law course or a lot of history courses, those things might stick out when someone's looking at your scholar profile. And then any other interests, these are the things that you wanna go back and say, I have an interest in cooking, reading, this, this, and this. And when you're looking for scholarships, what should you be targeting? There are scholarships out there for people who like to read. There are scholarships out there for people who like to cook. So this is the value of putting it all in one place. Um, so now that you have the scholar profile, let me back up. Here's what I want you to do. Create it. If you don't have one, create it soon, this week. If you are a sophomore, freshman, um, or junior, update it after every semester. I had my sons update it during their winter break and their summer break because I didn't want them to try to remember and re have to recall and forget key things that they've participated in. You can use this for letters of recommendation. You could give it to a recommender and say, here's my scholar profile to give you more information about me to write from. You can attach it to your college applications or scholarship application. Only do so if that entity allows for additional documents. If an entity tells you, please don't send us any more information than what we asked you for, then don't attach it. But if they allow for additional documents, absolutely attach it. And lastly, wouldn't this be helpful if you were writing essays and you don't have to try to remember, well, what is it I did? I know I did some community service work. Now they want me to talk about leadership. What was I a leader in? You already have it in front of you to be able to leverage. Then uh, part of the application, we talked about transcripts already. The only key thing that I want to point out on this slide is please find out the process early and make sure that as your high school is sending out your transcripts, that you make sure they actually get sent out. They actually get received by the entity who needs it before your deadline. There's nothing worse than you're waiting on every, everything you submitted and your transcripts haven't been received. They're not going to review your college or your scholarship package until they get all the documents. And you better make sure they're in, ideally, before the deadline. Also, we talked about the SAT and ACT. We talked about this last week in our session. But I do want to reiterate um, that as you consider taking the test, outside of COVID, I encourage students to take both tests. Take both tests, see which one you naturally test the best at, and then retake, take a SAT prep course, and then retake that test again. But with COVID, a lot of schools are going test optional, meaning they don't require you to have it to get accepted into the university. But guess what? You know how many students I ran into over the last couple of years with high, high GPAs, like 4.3, 4.8, who didn't take either test? 
and they didn't con get considered for that college's merit scholarships because they didn't have SAT or ACT test scores. So I would encourage you, even during COVID, to still take one or two, one or the other of these tests so that you can have scores to share with the colleges that you really want to attend to be considered for merit scholarships. And then I've in included their websites because you do have to register to take the SAT and the ACT test and their websites are here for you. So now that you have your transcripts, you've got your application, you've got to, you know, if, the, if they ask you for an essay or letters of recommendation, remember the applications, the scholarship applications, they don't care if you have a letter of recommendation or an essay written to why you should admit me into this college. They're asking you for a letter of recommendation or an essay and, and it should answer the question, why should I give you my money? Why should you be awarded a scholarship? So as you're seeking out letters of recommendation, make sure you get your recommenders to give you both types, one for college admissions and one for scholarships because they're written slightly different. Very important um, tip that I try to share. As you're writing your essays, follow the guidelines that they're asking you to. Nothing worse than you're not following directions and reading their instructions. If they say type it, type it. If they say handwrite it, handwrite it. If they say stay 100, 500 words, don't give them 502. This isn't your process. That's the quickest way to get yourself discriminated. Not discriminated, but disqualified from what it is that they're doing next with evaluating your application. Start early writing your essays. I encourage students to start writing essays as early as the summer of their sophomore or junior year. Um, you have more time in the summer. I wouldn't wait till my senior year to start writing essays. Have essays written, I don't think I put it in here, but I have a list of different type of topics they ask you to, leadership, community service, what are you doing to make a difference in your community, all different kind of scenarios. Pick some of the common ones um, and write essays. Get somebody else to proofread it. I have an undergraduate degree, two master's degrees and a doctorate, and I still get people to critique my writing. Never be so arrogant to think that you can't make a mistake or that you couldn't strengthen your own writing, whether it's a teacher, a parent, or someone else you trust who has really good uh, English insights, have them look it over. And be prepared to write on different topics and always save your work. You can reuse that content over and over again. I don't, I don't um, prescribe to writing an essay, balling it up, throwing it away because you use it one time. Save them all electronically on your computer because I did this with my son and he, he, he as we saved everything and you'd be surprised how many um, scholarships wanted you to write on leadership. Well, wait a minute, didn't we already write an essay on leadership? Well, let's dust that one off first. So use those um, tools um, and not have to recreate it every time you want to write an essay. Then getting your letters of recommendation, start looking early for recommenders. You have teachers, coaches, community leaders, folks that you already know that think about you in a very positive regard and would be absolutely honored to write a letter recommendation for you. Ask them early, give them the instructions, and always set their deadline earlier than your deadline. You don't want to wait till the last minute and be like, oh, I need a letter recommendation by Friday and it's Tuesday. Don't do that. If as early as you know you need recommenders, please reach out to them. And then ask them to write you letters and maybe even sign them generally. One of the things I encourage students to do is to not use the entity's name. Um, when you're getting letters of recommendation for colleges, have them write a Dear College Admissions Official instead of Dear um, Penn State University. If you do a general um, Dear so-and-so, it gives you the ability to reuse that letter over and over again without having to keep going back with every school, every scholarship. Dear scholarship entity, I strongly recommend Christy for X scholarship. And it will greatly help you to be able to get and reuse that material. Now, lastly, um, I, I haven't heard many people recommend this, but I do for most of the students that work with me and come through my programs. I have them redraft their own letter of recommendation. So I'm gonna pick on um, Kristen and Kristen, I'm a student and I'm coming to you and I've already pre-drafted my own letter of recommendation. I have my scholar profile and I need you as my English 11 teacher to write me a letter of recommendation. 
Here's how that conversation will go, students. And then Kristen, when I'm done making my request to you, I want you to let me know if you would be more willing to write a letter of recommendation. Hi, Miss Kristen, you remember me? I'm Christy, I'm from your English, 10, 11, English 11 class. And I'm now at a point where I'm applying to colleges and for scholarships. I would be honored if you would be one of my letter, write a letter of recommendation for me. Here is my scholar profile, my one page resume, my scholar profile and a pre-drafted letter, um, letter of recommendation for you to consider. And it looks something like this. And um, I would love it and be honored if you could tailor this letter based on what you learned from me and my scholar profile. And um, I'm happy to send it to you electronically for you to tailor it and send me back a letter that represents how you view me. Now, Ms. Kristen, if you can come off mute and let me know, would you be willing to write a letter for a student like that? Yes, I would, I would be very willing to uh, write a letter of recommendation because you have given me all the information and I wouldn't have, it would be um, a lot easier for me to write it and less time consuming because I have that information right there. Excellent. To draft something from memory. Thank you. It saves her time. Help people who are helping you. And this is what I include this template in my book and workbooks. And I'll tell you, you can fill it in. It's formatted. I have it electronically. So it's in Microsoft Word. I try to give students tools instead of them having to create the tools, focus on the content in the tools. That's the true value. And you can use this and streamline and save a lot of time for your recommenders. So I highly encourage you to do so. So as we're coming to, toward the end of our um, college funding talk, I would highly encourage you to think about your journey. And as you are going through the process, you should be selecting your major, applying for those college, to those colleges, completing the FAFSA, applying for scholarships. There's all kinds of scholarships out there we've talked about. There's plenty of scholarships for all kinds of students, minority scholarships, um, you name the different type of scholarships. But there are plenty of individuals who really wanna support students um, going to school, um, high school students and continuing students. Make sure that if you don't like what you see in your financial aid award letter from that college, once you've gotten your FAFSA in and they send you back the award letter, appeal it. How many of you know that you can appeal a financial aid award letter? What? Yes, you can. And here's what I mean by that. You might have a difference in your income now than you did when you completed it. There may be other extenuating circumstances that aren't taking into consideration. Good, Adrienne, I'm glad, I'm glad you knew that. Um, I'm encouraged by that. Um, so you want to know, how do I do that? What I encourage you to do, if you ever feel like, you know what, they're crazy if they think this is all that I can, you know, I can pay this much. This is my situation. Things have changed or they look different than what they think. Let me appeal it. The first thing I would encourage you to do is call the financial aid department and ask them what their appeal process is. They may say, write a letter or fill out a form. It's different from each, for each school. And so you certainly want to um, give them that opportunity to tell you their process. Select, um, and, and, and once you've applied to colleges and you've gotten your award letter, you've gotten the appeal stuff straightened out, compare all of your financial aid award letters. Then you select a college you want to attend. You want to factor in your selected college based on who's going to save you the most money. You don't have to pay as much out of pocket or get student loans. And then you make a decision. Then you accept their financial aid award. And then you start paying those enrollment fees, housing deposits, some of those things that are on your college plan that we've been talking about that you have to be mindful of. So as my last um, official slide, I'm just gonna abbreviate and say, don't let the funding part of the college planning process be an afterthought. Sit down as a family and talk about what that means to you and put together a winning system. I did that with my sons and it was not um, overwhelming and it doesn't have to be. Look for scholarships until you graduate. No, not from high school, but from college. I have so many students say, well, Miss Christy, well, how long should I look for scholarships? Unless you're allergic to money, and you have it all covered, I would invite you to look for scholarships the whole time you're in college. Track your process and get organized. If you are a sophomore, junior, senior, it's not too early to get organized. Get a folder system, a hard copy folder system, and an electronic one. 
save all your username and passwords in a place that you and your student can access them. My son and I, we did that and it saved us a lot of time and energy. Don't just rely on the students to have it. Parents have it too. And create a separate email account just for your college planning and funding endeavors. Most teenagers I know aren't checking emails daily. And I was afraid that my sons would miss key deadlines because a lot of these entities, colleges and scholarships, they were sending things for action in email. And if you're not checking every day, you're gonna miss those unique opportunities to make sure that you get those actions in by their deadlines. Don't waste people's time and please learn how to say thank you because there are gonna be many people that are gonna help you throughout this process. We do have upcoming webinars. As I um, bring my talk to a close and take any final questions, I wanna remind you all that we have a Spanish version of tonight's webinar tomorrow. So if you have Spanish speaking friends who you think could benefit, please encourage them to participate. Same time tomorrow night at 6.30. Also, our AKA chapter, we have a whole initiative around helping students. So if you need help with um, our hashtag CAP program, we're offering webinars on the SAT, ACT prep coming up in April and May. Also, we have HBCU and PWI College um, admissions panel coming up in June, and we're helping students over the summer with essays and writing, le getting letters of recommendation. And the website, if you wanna sign up for any of those events, is listing here, listed up at the top, and I'll share these slides with everyone. Um, so now I am going to pause and we're going to have some student giveaways. I'm going to ask three questions from my webinar tonight and um, you'll have a chance to win copies of my college planning strategies book and workbook. I'm trying to get them both in this frame, frame book and workbook. And we're going to do three student giveaways. So the first student giveaway is going to be based off of the question what does the FAFSA stand for? Anybody remember? Type it in the chat if you know what FAFSA stands for. <clears throat> Anybody? Anybody? Y'all got Google, come on. All right, All thank right. you, Elaine. 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 Excellent. Elaine, we need your last name. And if you could DM Miss um, Kristen and share um, with her your um, contact information so we can mail the book to you, that would be great. Don't do it in the, the everyone, do it in a direct message so that you're not putting your um, information out to everyone. Actually, Free what application. I'm gonna do, what I'm going to do is I'm putting my email address in the chat and you can just email me your information even better so yeah. all the uh, all the winners email miss Kristen your contact information it stands mm -hmm. for the free application for federal student aid thank you okay. that's one all right the okay. second giveaway who can name one type of scholarship that you can apply for and it's not a particular entity, but the categories. I listed several categories of scholarships. Who can name one? Adri Adriana. Adriana, yeah, Snipes Fields. Excellent, Adriana. You were quick. You were quick on that. <laughs> she was a wildcat. All right, merit based, needs based, merit based, athletic. Um, there were interest based, military, and so many, many more. But thank you very much, Adriana. Adriana, email me your information and I will we'll get that to Dr. Murray and make sure you get your prize. Excellent. And then the last question, who can name one of the Psi Psi Omega chapter categories of scholarships that I highlighted? I mentioned we give scholarships away in my AKA chapter and in one of these areas. Who can name one of those areas? Leadership. Okay, Adriana, you're right. So no one else can use leadership, but Adriana, we're going to give a third person a chance to win. But Adriana was right with leadership. So you now the third person can't use leadership. What's another category? Good, K Brown. K Brown, HBCU, yes. 
Yeah. All right. Kay Brown, Please can send you information. Your, Kay Brown, can you put your full name in the chat? We don't know um, what the K stands for. Kina, wonderful. And nice I'm, to meet you, Kina. And I'm putting my email back in there so you can have easy access to it. Excellent. So thank you all um, for um, participating with those questions. Feel free to follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, TikTok. I have a lot of videos on TikTok for students. Um, so feel free to reach out. Please take a minute to go back through the chat and find the link for the um, Sci Sci Omega um, scholarships. Those are open until next week. So. All right, let's get those applications in. We want to see a high turnout. And if you're a family and you would still like to get access to both the books or workbooks, I would highly encourage you to visit me at www.investinothers.com. There's a plethora of resources there. And we have other recorded webinars that you could take advantage of um, on particular topics. If you want to, if you're writing essays right now, watch the one we have on YouTube for essay writing, et cetera. So there's a lot of great information that we're putting out there. And so with that being said, we're gonna just, I'm gonna come off of sharing. I'd love to see some faces and hear voices or just take some questions. And I'll try to go back through the chat and see if there were questions that I didn't get to answer while, we, while we're waiting. Um, let's see. My daughter just used her scholar profile to land her first job. So that's another way your scholar profile can help you. It can help you get a job. I'm gonna have to add that to my presentation. That's great to hear. Let's see. Okay, great. It looks like um, you requested access to the Facebook group. Excellent, Darlene. I'll make sure I invite you in. How long is the application? I think I covered that. Um, some Stacy mentioned that niche, N-I-C-H-E, is a great site for looking for scholarships. I would agree. Um, Elaine said her son is a swimmer, so start looking for scholarships for students who are athletes, who are swimmers specifically. Excellent. Um, Stacy mentioned, how long does it generally take them to say yes or no? When you say yes or no, are you talking about the colleges with their financial aid award letters? And if so, I think I answered that one earlier. Not necessarily the colleges, but, um, you know, the other outside scholarships. Like, it, is it, it like varies. two months? If there's, for example, if there's a deadline that, let's say, is April 14th. So if there's a deadline, like ours is coming up in mid-April, um, it could take, it depends on the entity. The entity will generally tell how, how long it'll take them to send out information on their awards. So check on their website and with them. Kristen, I don't know if you want to speak to like what our general yeah. practice is. So our deadline is um, April 15th. And I, in, in the information that's provided on our website and in the letter, it says that all applicants will know um, whether or not they've received the scholarship by May 16th. And the process is we have to get all the applications in. Um, they're either emailed back to me and then I disseminate it to the committee or they are... Um, mailed like snail mailed and then someone has to go to the mailbox and pick them and pick them up um and then again i scan them in it's it's a, it's a lengthy process we all score them we come back together and we sit and discuss it our goal is that let uh, winners know by may 16th so that um awards are awarded at the end of year awards ceremonies and i know for stafford county public schools um I've, I've gotten most of those dates and I'm waiting for those dates from Park here as well. So that's the process. Awesome. I also, I, I'd also like to advocate for the organizational scholarships because my daughter did get one from Alpha Kappa Alpha um, and it paid for two years of her to attend a technical college. So that's thank you. <laughs> thank you. We'd like to hear those uh, testimonials because these strategies work and the information you know, a lot of organizations are doing to help students in the communities. They're they're out in the communities trying to help. So definitely take advantage of them. Um, last question. Yes. We'll probably Just to give a, a, a quick plug um, for all our Divine Nine groups, Delta Sigma Theta, Omega Sci Phi, Kappa Alpha Psi, uh, 
alpha phi alpha, zeta phi beta, phi beta sigma, iota phi theta. Who am I missing? Sigma gamma, sigma rho. gamma rho. And then of course, um, the, the first um, African-American sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha R sorority, they all offer scholarships. So if you want to Google the Divine Nine, they will all offer. Yes. Yes. And, and they all and have yes. local they all have local presences here in our community. So great odds of getting those scholarships. Yes. And I, I do also wanna... found that that you don't have to be, um, for example, you don't have to be a female exactly. uh, to apply for um, you know, of uh, sorority or vice versa. Now nah. there, and, and that's why reading the scholarship, we often disqualify ourselves before we qualify ourselves. That's why reading the instructions and the eligibility is so critical for every scholarship because we make assumptions and we need not. Unless the scholarship eligibility requirement says you can't, we only want females or we only want males, it might be generally open to everybody. So I think that's a great point, Stacy, that you made. Adriana also asked a question, how do I get my child? This will be the last question we take tonight. How do I get my child to get these essays done and apply for scholarships? Let me just say, I'm gonna share with you how I did mine. Some students are more self-motivated than others. So if you have those self-motivated students and you don't really have to nudge them, gently nudge them, fantastic. But if you do like I did with one of my sons, one or two things, when he got on my nerves or I use it as a positive form of punishment, most of my punishments for my children were things that were designed to help them in the future. So if he got on my nerves, I would say, you know what, please go take a break. And while you go take a break, go to your room for a bit and come back with five scholarships you can apply for. Or go take a break. You know what, you got this essay that needs to be in by Sci Sci Omega's deadline next week. Why don't you go spend 30 minutes and write an essay and bring it back and let me take a look at it. So you have to find creative ways to encourage them. Sometimes they might not be initiated on their own, but um, they have to get done. Now, my son would draft his essay and I would review it and I would send him back and tweak it. We would have that process. And then the more he learned to write, the more confidence he gained. Sometimes the students may not, they lack confidence in their writing skills. So if you can find a way to understand why, what is their apprehension about writing and how can I help them overcome that apprehension? Maybe pair them up with a friend or a student who's really good at writing. Some, some way to kind of help them gain more confidence might help too. So those are just my, my, my strategies. All right. Well, we have approached the end of our session tonight. I hope that all the parents and students who attended found value and the strategies and tips that we're sharing on college funding and scholarships. We thank you for your time tonight and we wish you well in your endeavors. I will email the slides to everyone so that you can have them for you. Kristen, I'll give you any last thoughts and wishes. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Again, another great session, Dr. Murray. I always enjoy um, listening to you um, as a special treat. Uh, my husband actually sat in and got a lot of information too. So he was um, hyperly excited to receive this information. And so, um, I just want to remind you, if you're one of the three winners from tonight, please make sure you email me your information because I won't be able to retrieve this chat information. So email me at kmckinney, M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y, at staffordschools.net. Um, again, Dr. Murray, thank you. I have a junior, rising senior, who, like I said, we were taking lots of notes. Excellent. And the fact that your husband was watching an hour and a half webinar and he was excited um, speaks to what I hope is the value and the information we're presenting. Because to spend an hour and a half with me and to be charged up in any way or any remote way <laughs> is really good. And so I wish everyone much success in their endeavors. And don't hesitate to reach out to us if there's anything we can do to answer any additional questions you have. Thank you all and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.